We continue to count down the 2023-24 NHL season, and we continue to look at our Pacific Division rivals with Chris Golick of Locked On Golden Knights, next on Locked On LA Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, welcome to Locked On LA Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On LA Kings your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love for you to leave us a positive comment on Apple Podcasts if you're a fan of the show. And we're on YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you're enjoying this content. I'm Eddie Garcia, your host of Locked On LA Kings. I've worked in sports media for the past 30 years, 20 plus years at the Fox Sports Radio Network. I'm also co host of the Puck Podcast. It's a weekly NHL review show that's been putting out content for 17 years. And of course, a passionate LA Kings fan for 30 years. We are seven days away from the start of the NHL season, and we continue to preview our Pacific Division rivals, and we are happy to welcome in Chris Golick. He is the co-host of Locked on LA Kings. Excuse me. He's the co-host. Maybe he is the co-host of Locked on LA Kings after this. He is the co-host of Locked on Golden Knights. And uh, you may have heard that they uh, that they won the Stanley Cup uh, last season. We're going to talk about that and more. You can follow him on Twitter at TD Chris G and Locked On Golden Knights at Locked On VGK. Chris, I was going to ask how's your off season, but since you guys won the cup, I'm guessing it was uh, this was all right. It was fun. I mean, it it was short, you know, which every hockey fan certainly loves and appreciates. Uh, June was cool. I feel like August was, and this is probably the same for all of us, I feel like August kind of lagged, and then September kind of got the juices flowing again, and here we are now. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because I remember when the Kings won their first cup in 2012, there was actually a big part of me that really didn't want the season to start, because it kind of meant that the party stopped a little bit, right? And uh, I just wonder, how are you feeling now that the new year is is getting ready to start uh, after you won your first cup? I mean, to be fair, Vegas doesn't need a Stanley Cup to party. That's all we do in this town anyway, all season, all year long. And uh, the Golden Knights uh, winning a Stanley Cup is certainly uh, going to elevate the parties and uh, the admission price for uh, many nightclubs around town because you never know where the Stanley Cup's going to pop up. Well, uh, were there any legendary or infamous stories as far as uh, the celebration with any individual players with the Cup or anything like that? It all seemed to happen right after the team won the cup in Vegas It popping up at random clubs. And you see the half the players without their shirts off getting miscellaneous uh, jungle juice, as we've been calling it, dumped all over them because the players just pouring wherever they can in the cup. They're drinking it, going bonkers and stuff like that. Once the actual days with the cup got underway, there wasn't a whole lot of shenanigans that really made it out um we were talking with keegan colasar uh at a charity a golf outing about a month or so ago now and he he conceded that the first part of his party was kind of fun and you know everyone reminiscing and doing their thing and then the drinks really got going and uh it got pretty ugly but there's not really a whole lot of stories like that mm-hmm. and honestly it kind of let me down a little bit i thought uh, i thought the boys could have done a little better after uh you know what we saw them go through you know, up and down the Las Vegas Strip uh, the moment they won the cup. Wow, that is uh, that's a little bit surprising. But like you said, maybe it's uh, there's so many parties in Vegas that this was just another another one, uh, even though it was obviously the first major sports championship in the history of that city. You had UNLV in basketball, but... Uh, kind of with the Aces, right? Aces first, kind of. Oh, we can... okay, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong as we now transition into uh, the upcoming season, but... Seems like the Golden Knights are pretty much the same team that they were a year ago, which was, oh, by the way, good enough to win the Stanley Cup. I know Riley Smith has moved on, and he was a, a very important piece of the team. Uh, you did re-sign Ivan Barbashev, who was a trade deadline pickup. Uh, other than that, am I missing anything, or is this kind of like uh, running it back with the squad that just won the Cup? Running it back with the squad that pretty much won the Cup. Uh, Riley Smith was the collateral damage, if you will. Um, the choice, even though Kelly McCrimmon, the general manager of the Golden Knights, didn't necessarily say it like this, the trade was 27 year old Ivan Barbashev, who is in the midst of his prime, gets to now get a full season of a contending roster. We'll see what happens once the lights go on next week, of course, but it'll be interesting to see how he does as a full season replacing 
the 32 year old Riley Smith, who he's got some good years left, but uh, let's face it at 32, you're probably at the peak and starting to go downhill a little bit. No disrespect. That's just the reality of uh, NHL athletes where Barbashev probably can still climb a couple notches up the hill. No Phil Kessel. Um, Kessel was a lot of fun and, it's unfortunate to see that he hasn't uh, signed a contract yet anywhere. That's um makes me a little bit sad as a Kessel fan, unfortunately. Maxime Comtois, someone you should be familiar with, mm-hmm. obviously former Anaheim Duck, is here with the Golden Knights on a PTO. But I don't know. I mean, I was excited about the prospects of him joining the team. I watched like some of his videos and you know see how he scored a lot of his goals and such. But we just haven't seen it yet in training camp so hopefully tonight uh well last night i should say now because technically we're you know know what i'm saying we'll see how he does in tuesday night's affair against the san jose sharks so you guys played uh like i don't know 17 goalies uh last season (laughs) what what is the what is yeah maybe what is what's the goalie situation like coming into this season for vegas i'm down on the goalie situation and i've been getting torn to shreds all summer for it um in theory if logan thompson and aiden hill can both be healthy all season, then great. That's going to be one of the better, if not, you know, top five-ish, top six, just whatever, duos in the National Hockey League. Staying healthy is the concerning part, though. Um, Aiden Hill still to this this part of his career has never started more than 27 games, I believe, in a regular season. Logan Thompson in his first ever um, professional season, his first full professional season, only lasted 35 or so games before multiple injuries sidelined him. So it's going to be all eyes potentially on our third goaltender, Yuri Patera, who's going to start the season with the Henderson Silver Knights of the AHL. He played two games with the Golden Knights last year, two wins, but two games last year at the NHL level. Um, I did ask Kelly McCrimmon about his confidence in the goaltenders and basically what happens if Aiden or Logan do go down. And Kelly McCrimmon was very positive. He felt that Patera painted the right picture in his mind that he can be a quality NHL goaltender. Now, if there's a long-term injury, let's see if uh, McCrimmon backs up those words or if he does go shopping at that point. Hopefully it's not the case. Hopefully Patera, maybe we see him in Vegas 10 or 12 times, but Logan and Aiden hopefully can carry the mail. If they're healthy, it'll be great, but it's, there's some risk there in my opinion. Vegas has always had a very interesting situation going on in net. Obviously, they had the incredibly popular Marc-Andre Fleury. Then there was the drama when they brought in Robin Leonard. Now, Leonard's future in hockey appears to be up in the air. And then you've had a couple of seasons where you had kind of a rotating door with all kinds of guys coming in and out. Um, Is is Robin Leonard ever going to play hockey again? It's probably a question you can't answer, but for people who don't know, uh, he missed almost, was it all of last season with a hip hip injury? And now he's not even with the team. I think he's on long-term injured reserve, and it doesn't seem like there's any uh, thoughts of him joining the team anytime soon. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, McCrimmon did mention that Robin will be LTIR for this season um, at his media wow. availability uh, when training camp opened about a week, uh, week ago now, I think is all it was, right? Not too long ago. Um, so, Robin, I mean, we hope he can get, whatever's going on obviously his athletic ability is dampered by his health issues it seems like it's hip issues slowing him down and then of course there's all the personal stories and stuff like that and you know from the human side you just hope he can get everything together with what what's going on he's got a family and i think he is here in vegas still there's been some murmurs of him kind of being cited not necessarily around the team um They've mentioned maybe his physical appearance wasn't what you'd expect right now, unfortunately. So, mm-hmm. you know, human side first. I hope he gets whatever needs to happen, gets it together, and then he can come back. And whether it's with the Golden Knights or someone else down the line, you know, you just hope the best for him. We're going to talk to Chris about something that happened recently between the Golden Knights and the LA Kings that had a lot of people around the NHL talking a bit. We'll do that next here on Lockdown LA Kings, your team every day. Hey, if you are uh, drafting a fantasy team, do you ever wish you could do the same thing with your business team? If you're building a roster to win the league, then you need 
Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills, but you can do it all with Indeed. Indeed knows that when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. And that's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right. We continue with Chris Golick, the host of Locked On Golden Knights. Um, did want to ask you something about, we talked about goaltending for Vegas, and I brought this up with the LA Kings, and let me know what you think about this. I've always... Uh, I'm not always, but I've I've liked to use the Golden Knights as an example of kind of a, maybe a change in philosophy in the NHL. And I think the LA Kings have adopted this policy. Um, you can get by with a good goalie, obviously can win a Stanley Cup, if you build a solid team around that goalie. There's enough good goaltending out there where you can find, you don't need to have an Andre Vasilevsky or Connor Hellebuck or one of those elite, elite goalies that makes a ton of money. And I've always used the Golden Knights as an example from last season. Um, do you think that they're a good example of that kind of philosophy? Uh, and do you see a kind of a change maybe in some respects with the philosophy around goaltenders in the NHL and how much you pay them and what you can do with them? I think Jonathan Quick would have won the Stanley Cup last season had he started all the games in net for the Golden Knights. Wow. I mean that half-heartedly. I mean that, you know, a little bit of joking, obviously. But point being is, I, I yes, I do support your statements. Cassidy, one of the first things he mentioned when he arrived, you know, before last season was a goaltender, a goaltender friendly system that cuts down on odd man rushes, does a really good job of protecting the neutral zone and, of course, the defensive side of the ice. So Logan Thompson, and Aiden Hill are two very, very good goalies. Um, they can I mean, I'm higher on Logan Thompson than Aiden Hill against something else I've been uh just absolutely torn to shreds about in the in the off season, but I just believe Logan is the future of the Golden Knights, even though he's making basically twenty percent of what Aiden Hill is making right now, which will make things a little more interesting as the season progresses. But I'm with you. I mean, like Vasilevsky, obviously, Stanley Cups and such. Mark Andre Fleury, well, technically he was benched for one of the cups to a backup goalie, but you know, looking back at the Blackhawks, a team that I grew up supporting. Antti Niemi is a Stanley Cup winner. Corey Crawford is a Stanley Cup winner. They're good goalies. Like, they're fine. They're not the type of goalies that are going to, you know, do what Jonathan Quick did in his heyday, you know, and, and stuff like that. So I'm with you. I mean, you don't need to spend six, seven, eight, ten million dollars on a goalie when you can get two pretty good goalies for, you know, three, four, five million dollars or one goalie for that type of money. And then you have a, you know, like an AHL backup kind of learning the ropes and stuff. And then you catch lightning in a bottle, use that money to get another assets, you know, in the, for the forwards or for the defense. So something happened in a preseason game between the Kings and Golden Knights uh, the other day. And it was ironic. I actually had just reached out to you about coming on the show and it had happened like shortly thereafter. So we had it a little bit did. of a, yeah, that was, we that had was a little fun. bit of an exchange on that, but uh, for people who may have missed it somehow, uh, the Golden Knights and the Kings were playing the preseason game. Captain Mark Stone of the Vegas Golden Knights got hit hard by a Crushed. King's relative no-name, Hayden Hodgson. Uh, Stone and the Golden Knights took exception to the hit. There was a brief scuffle. There was some words said afterwards uh, to the media. Uh, but it did, it did create a, a debate amongst those in the NHL as to if you're a veteran player, do you get some kind of special treatment in the preseason? Or if you're a young player and you're trying to make a name for yourself, uh, is you know you're trying to get coaches' attention, trying to make a team, whether with the Kings or somewhere else. Kind of that debate of what's the protocol, what's uh, how do you handle that? Uh, and, and there were definitely some interesting points made on both sides. I certainly understand, I, and I said this on our show. If Andre Kopitar got blasted by some no-name dude on the Golden Knights, would I be happy about that? No, I would not. Especially you know, Mark Stone has obviously some injury history, but at the same time, it's an NHL game. You're eligible to be hit if you feel that was a clean hit. I do, uh, and it was and, and I hundred and I under and I understand a young guy wanting to. I don't know if he targeted Mark Stone. I don't think he did. I think he's just looking to make a big play to get the coach's attentions and try and make a team. So I get both sides of it. What were your thoughts on it? So there's a lot of things to dissect here. Number one, um, 
Bruce Cassidy in the post game that night actually questioned Mark Stone's positioning. He was he basically said as a right winger, why is he in that spot on the ice to put himself in that spot? I thought that was the one of the most interesting takeaways that just kind of got buried amongst all the um, feistiness and Twitter memes and everything else that happened. Poor Brant Clark, by the way, that dude, uh, poor <laughs> Brant Clark. Um, so it's not often we're going to say this when we're talking hockey, but Brad Marchand, I don't know if you saw this article with, with um, Boston Hockey now, um, Brad Marchand is the voice of reason here. And again, wow. something we're not going to say too often in life. All so right. Marchand was asked about it by the Boston Hockey Now writer, and Marchand summed it up pretty well. You have all these AHL players, their job is to make the roster. When you're trying to make the roster, you're trying to steal someone's career. When And I, I don't mean steal by going hit a player you know, and hurt them. Right. Mm -hmm. Just simply you're trying to steal someone else's spot on the roster. So that's the type of hunger and drive that these, I won't say young, younger, yes, but Hodgson, he's 27. So he's not yeah. necessarily a youngster, but he's been around for a long time. He's been in the HL for a really long time, but only seven games in the NHL. And I believe just three NHL points. So he's, he knows he's at the point of his career where it's this year or next year, or, you know, him and the Ontario rain, they're going to be buddies, you know, until he's 35 years old or something like that. So the question that I would ask, first of all, I agree. The hits legal. There was nothing wrong. Stone out of position, head was down. He's backhanding at the puck when he gets hit. So there's nothing did Brand or excuse me, did Hodgson, I hope I'm saying the name right, did he target him? No. Did he target the puck carrier and make a big hit? Absolutely. Was it because it was Mark Stone? No. The question I pose to you, this is maybe where the debate can start, though. I get an AHL kid hitting someone. I do. I 100% get it, and I support it. It's hockey. Fine. Whatever. Do you think if Anze Kopitar, I hope I said his first name right, do you think Kopitar would make that same exact hit on Mark Stone in the preseason? No, I don't. Okay, and that's that's the that's the unwritten code that I support too. I don't think a vet on vet hit like that is going to happen intentionally. It could happen, but I think that particular instance where Stone has his head down, I don't think Drew Doughty's going to do it, and he's he's got an edge to him. Like I just think there's that unwritten code, and, and they don't want to get hit back like that in the preseason either. Yeah. But you know what? A kid taking a shot, fine. And Stone, keep your head up. Like that's hockey. I totally agree with you. Uh, one of the great things I like about having our rivals uh, come and join us is to get an unfiltered, you know, opinion on on my on our team, on the Kings. Now we have we have good guests, love our guests. Some of them obviously work for the team, and you understand that they're making temper their comments. Perhaps am I supposed to be uh, the heel right now? You don't have is that to. What be. You're setting me up for no. You don't <laughs> have to be. I just want you to be totally honest and and tell tell me what do you think. About the LA Kings this year, they made a big trade in the offseason to get Pierre Luc Dubois uh, to try and get by the Vegas Golden Knights and the Edmonton Oilers that they've lost to two years in a row in the postseason. What did you think about that move? And do you think the Kings have done anything with that move to make them better to get past guys, the teams like the Golden Knights and the Oilers this, this postseason? The trade was important. Um, there's a lot of people concerned that the Kings did give up too much in that deal. There was a lot of depth traded the other way but you know the fantasy football side of me here always believes that as long as my side of the deal involves receiving the best player in the deal i won the trade so i think health pending of the support players for the los angeles kings and if dubois can you know have a nice what 78 point season 75 point season i think that's where where they would really like him to get to i think it could be a really good trade i mean Listen, the Kings were close last year, 100-point season. You took Edmonton to six games. If you come back with the same roster, you're going to get the same result, right? You're going to have another really good regular season, but you know you might get Edmonton in the first round. You might get Vegas in the first round. Or how about Seattle? We'll talk more about that, I think, later on. But point being is you can't sit still. And the Kings made a move, and they made a good move. And you know we'll see if Dubois can I – mean, there's been some concerns, right? What's like his third team in about the last four years, Winnipeg, Columbus, so – Hopefully there's nothing in the locker room going on there. The question I will ask, and kind of going about last season, first of all, I felt, uh, just honest opinion, I felt the, the Kings goalies last year were getting much more credit than they should have. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a lot of this, like the save percentage is right around 8, 9 or nine 900, like during the regular season. Um, records were good, so obviously a lot of support, you know, and goals and scoring and such. And Cam Talbot now, correct? Yep. 
And who's the other goalie? Is it still going to be? Well, it's either Phoenix Copley or David Riddick, who they brought in, who's bounced around in the NHL. And a bit. what's with it? Like three goalies, three three headed monster. There is the plan for one of them. I would think Riddick to go down to the AHL. Like, what's the plan there? Uh, well, it's to be determined, but yeah, that that's that seems to be the plan. And if he can clear waivers, uh, then he'll go down to the AHL. But we'll have to wait and see. But uh, he looked really good in the preseason game for the other day, for what that's worth. But yeah, they're uh, they've got three goalies all on one year deals, all making around a million dollars. So, uh, like I said, talking about just try and get a good goalie, money balling it, money balling and, it, like and it. build around him, and uh, hopefully that'll work out. But yeah, you're no, you're right. The, the Phoenix Copley last year. Uh, I believe he was third in the NHL in winning percentage, but his goals against and his and his save percentage were very average. But uh, as a former he won the owner, game, so. he won the as, game, yeah, as a credit. former owner of the Vegas Raiders, said, "Just win, baby," and uh, and that's what they were doing. He's also uh, calling his own fans brain dead right now. That same owner, the other owner of the Raiders. Right oh, now. I did not see that. Um, so, any thoughts on the LA Kings? Positive, negative? Just uh, as far as just looking at the team, is there any player on the team that you're really interested in seeing? Or, or we talked about the goaltending. That obviously is a concern about a lot of people with the Kings. When you talk about national pundits talking about the Kings this season, anything about the Kings uh, that, that jumps to your mind? Uh, Kopitar. I love to watch Kopitar. He's still, I think, my favorite player in the NHL. Oh. Dude plays the game right. He's kind of quiet out there, but he's a great leader. And it's just, you know, a joy to watch him when he does come to town. And I love maybe to sneak an interview or something when he does come, when the Kings do come, you know, a few times throughout the year and just to have that interaction with them. But Kopitar is a lot of fun. Drew Doughty, he is who he is, but he's he's fun type of guy you'd probably rather have on your team versus play against. Um Youngster Quentin Byfield be interesting to see what he can do, and um, you know, will, will we get to see Brant Clark on the roster this year at all? I th I think so, I think so. But there's another good young defenseman on the right side named Jordan Spence who's uh, playing Jordan really Spence, well yeah. as well. So a little bit of a competition there. Some some are wondering could we see them both on a, a pairing together, which we haven't seen yet. I'd love to see him try it in the preseason just to see how it would work out. But yes. Um, that I think we're going to see Brent Clark uh, this year. I think he is definitely ready. Yeah. We are going to get uh, see Mark Stone and how that hand goes, yeah. how that goes down next time. <laughs> yeah, if he's if he's uh, not still scared to death from uh, Mark Stone <laughs> grabbing him and scaring the life out of him, uh, we got a little bit more with Locked On Golden Knights co-host Chris Golick. We'll get his thoughts on the Pacific Division and uh, whether the Vegas where the Vegas Golden Knights fit into all that next on Locked On LA Kings, your team every day. I need to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Step into the action of the NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you have been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including point spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Visit FanDuel.com and include money lines, props, etc. FanDuel.com. All right, we are wrapping it up with Chris Golick, the host, co-host of Locked on Golden Knights for a couple more minutes. Um, before last season, there was a ton of talk about the Pacific Division being the worst division in hockey. Uh, lo and behold, the Pacific gets four teams into the playoffs. And, oh, by the way, the Stanley Cup winner came from the Pacific Division, so certainly opened some eyes, and uh, I think it uh, definitely is not the worst division in hockey. Um, but I do wonder about this season. Um, what do you think the the division looks like, and could the could the Pacific get five teams in the playoffs this season? So the question is of Cal, Gary, Anaheim, San Jose, and who am I forgetting? Vancouver and Vancouver which of those teams gets in. I mean, Vancouver quickly is just stuck in that weird spot between trying to become a playoff team and rebuilding, right? They got some really great talents, but they just never can put it together, right? The Flames seemed just to be a dumpster fire all season long when it came to off-season moves, the coaching situation, all the vets just simply wanting out of there. No one wants to commit once they're um, once they become UFA next season. And then you have San Jose. They finally started their rebuild, which is good for them. 
I don't think they did a very good job in that trade. They took a couple of bad contracts in return for letting Eric Carlson go to Pittsburgh and Montreal got involved as well. Um, Anaheim, I'm, I don't know. I feel just something a little different about Anaheim. You got Gudis there, obviously. Um, they've done a good job kind of shoring up the, the blue line a little bit. They gave up, I think, a league high average 39 shots per game. I mean, I don't care who the goalie is. You're not going to fare well there. Um, it's, will we get five teams? I don't know about that. But the team I'm kind of curious to see is Seattle. They um, uh, Nishushkin, I believe, the defenseman they brought in. And they're going to, I think Seattle might make a run for the division. Like everyone, obviously, mm-hmm. you're here in Vegas and Edmonton. The Kings were there. But no one's talking about Seattle. I don't think that's a good idea. I think Seattle's going to possibly surprise us. So do you see the same four making the playoffs again this season out of the Pacific? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know if any of the other teams have done enough to take that next step. Um, Anaheim, I'm just kind of hunchy about. I mean, you got young players, uh, McTavish, Drysdale, uh, of course, Trevor Zegras, and then obviously other players kind of coming up. You still got John Gibson back there who's going to give you a chance every game. It's either uh, one goal against or six goals against for Gibson, nothing in between it seems like. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the same four, I think. And Vegas is obviously the defending Pacific Division champs. Uh, we're going to see a repeat of that, or uh, obviously you're you know uh, you're going into the building every night, and teams are going to be up for you. The defending champs are in town, which is a great thing to to have. But you know you're going to get a lot of people's best shots every night. So what do you think? What about the Vegas Golden Knights this year? It's going to be tough. It's tough to repeat, even though we've seen it happen. You know, in recent times um, with what Pittsburgh and Tampa, and then Detroit not too long before that. So the possibility is there. Um, I just think Edmonton, at least in the regular season, is going to be shot out of a cannon. McDavid might have 240 points this year. It seems mm-hmm. like by the way he's going to go, and I just don't think Edmonton's ever going to let their foot off the gas. Where the Golden Knights, we did see them let their foot off the gas in the middle third of the season. Now they're coming in off of a short season. Vegas is going to be in the playoffs. I don't see any concerns there, barring something really strange happening. But a second-place finish, even a third-place finish in the Pacific would not surprise me for the Golden Knights. That is Chris Golick. He is the co-host of Locked On Golden Knights, along with Tony Dasko. You can check out Locked On Golden Knights wherever you find this podcast and uh, YouTube uh, channel as well. Chris, always a pleasure. Great stuff. Good to talk hockey with you. And uh, can't wait to get the season going and see what happens here this year in the Pacific Division with the Golden Knights and the LA Kings. Can't wait. It's going to be fun. Thank you. All right, Chris. Have a good time, and we'll we'll talk to you next time. All right. That was Chris Golick. We appreciate his time. For you everydayers, those of you listening, watch Locked on LA Kings every day. Coming up on Thursday's show, we're going to recap Tuesday's preseason game against the Sharks in Salt Lake City. Of course, Friday, we'll have our weekly fan feedback show. Any questions or comments on anything going on with the LA Kings, the email address, LockedOnEddy at gmail.com, E-D-D-I-E, LockedOnEddy at gmail.com. You can always leave your comments, of course, uh, below if you're watching on YouTube. And I need to remind you that the LA Kings play the San Jose Sharks tomorrow, 6 p.m. Pacific time in Salt Lake City. Catch every second of the Kings' hometown broadcast on Sirius XM or the SXM app. Just search LA Kings. We'd also love for you to stay interactive with the show on social media. You can follow us on Twitter. I'm still calling it Twitter. Uh, and Instagram, we are at Locked On LA Kings. I'm Eddie Garcia. Thanks for listening and watching this episode of Locked On LA Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Have a great day. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow. And as always, go Kings go.